Hey, tailgaters! Ross of the Pigskin Tales Podcast here. Feel that summer heat? It's not just the sun, it's the thrill of upcoming college football season, stoking the coals. So get ready for the season, dive into the history books with Homefield, the premium collegiate apparel brand from Indianapolis. Homefield crafts incredibly comfortable gear designed with iconic vintage nods over 150 colleges. A library of history right on your chest. Homefield is the Indiana Jones of collegiate apparel, uncovering hidden gems from school archives. Unique mascots, logos, and even unforgettable moments frozen in time. Visit homefieldapparel.com and shop the archives. Homefield Apparel, where comfort, nostalgia, and the spirit of college football history unite. Again, that's homefieldapparel.com. We have a special episode so from PigskinDispatch.com. We are going to go back in the archives and down do some research, one bring of the up some expert advice ever on one of the great history. innovators in one pro of the football history and high school history, for that matter. Level. The great coach, Not many Paul can say Brown. that. So sit Therefore, back, I can adjust your headsets, and listen That's to the, the great, great history Brown. of a great Thank you innovator for joining of us football history. Historical this is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. As pointed out in past posts, a handful of people stand out for their overwhelming contributions to the game that have made American football one of the greatest games of sports to watch and to participate in. The game of strategy is just great, and when you have some great innovators and strategists that have made their contributions, they need to be more well-renowned and remembered. Now, Paul Brown, the legendary high school, college, and professional coach slash executive, fits this very mold. Now, we went back to our Pigskin Dispatch audio archives from the last few years with interviews with experts on Coach Brown that have been mentioned, at least, that Jonathan Knight, George Bozica, uh, Ken Crippen, and Greg Tranter to help us understand the legend of Paul Brown. So to pay tribute to him and to these great experts that we've had, we're going to have this little audio documentary to fulfill this need. Paul Brown was born on September 7, 1908 in Norwalk, Ohio. He was a Pro Football Hall of Fame innovator, executive, and coach. And uh, we're going to talk about these many teams that he's been on. Now, his father uh, was a railroad dispatcher in town, but soon transferred from Norwalk to Maslin, Ohio. The younger Brown shortly thereafter enrolled at a local Washington high school in Maslin. At WHS, Brown played football, basketball, and baseball. He also excelled at running track. He was soon entrenched as the starting quarterback of the football team, and Brown led the Tigers to a 15-3 record in his two years there. Now, Paul Brown, soon after high school, enrolled at Ohio State University, dreaming of suiting up for the Ohio State Buckeyes football program. However, his dream ended abruptly when an assistant coach told him that he was too small and he was not even allowed to try out for the team because of his small stature. Now, his time in Columbus lasted only a year, and then he transferred to Miami University of Ohio that next fall. Now, fortunately for Brown, Chester Pister, the uh, Miami coaching staff, did not find him to be too small and allowed him to remain on the team. Now, due to some injuries, Brown was named the starting quarterback in his junior season and never let go of it. He guided the Redskins to records of 6-2 and two as a junior and 7-2 and two as a senior. In 1930, he moved from Oxford to Maryland to teach and coach at Severn Prep High School. Now, during the 1931 season, he left there and he earned a head coaching job at his alma mater, Maslin High School. 
Professional Football Research Association President George Bozica, a great historian of Ohio football and pro football, fills us in from there. In 1935, Paul Brown sort of came into his own. They went into the McKinley Masson game that year 9 0. They had outscored their opponents 477 to 13, and <laughs> McKinley came in 6 2 1, and they played at Lehman Stadium in Canton. Lehman Stadium was part of Kent Lehman High School, my alma mater. I went to Kent Lehman High School. It doesn't exist anymore. It's now a junior high at a different location. But it was a high school in Canton, and it had a stadium right in front of the high school. Uh, old concrete seats. And I saw that you would have to see it to believe it, but they said they used to be able to get like 14 to 12,000 people in there. How they did that I to this day, I really don't know. My dad said they used to bring in bleachers and stuff like that. They would close the streets all around it because it was right in the middle of a neighborhood. I, I, it's always fascinating to me having gone to high school there that you know Paul Brown coached there. I, I always found that just fascinating. He coached on that field, that same field where you know, our football team practiced every night. So <laughs> it was just amazing. Well, they beat McKinley that day, six to nothing. And Masson was named state champs and national champs. And that got Paul Brown going. Aiken moved on to the college ranks, but Paul Brown stayed in Maslin. And basically, I think he is responsible for creating the, the animal that we now know as, as Maslin. From 1935 to 1940, he went 58-1-1. One one. Wow. <laughs> he won 58 out of 60 games. He lost one and he tied one. He won six state titles. He won six straight games over McKinley after having lost to them his first three years there. And he won four national championships. His greatest team, and it's considered one of the greatest teams in high school football history, is his 1940 team. They were led by two future Cleveland Browns, uh, Tommy James and Horace Gillum. They went 10 and 0. They outscored their opponents 477 to six for the season. 11 of the players on that team made all Ohio that year. 11 players made all Ohio Jeez. from one high school. Wow. Uh, they scrimmaged Kent State University that year. Kent State ended up that season eight and one. Maslin beat him 47 to nothing. Definitely had a lot of success at Maslin. And he invented things such as the playbook. It was first used hand signals to call plays. This, these signals later led to a person to person system of having a player, often lineman, shuttling the offensive plays into the quarterback. The success might have been a little bit too much for his high school peers in the coaching ranks, though. The Ohio High School Coaches Association urged Paul Brown to move to Ohio State. Now, that may have been, you know, that you could say, well, you, you could look at that one of two ways. If you could consider it a compliment because they were saying how good it was, but I also think that maybe they wanted to get him out of their ranks because he was dominating the, you know, the opposition so much. So he did become Ohio State coach in 1941. And actually he said that his 1940 Maslin team could have beat his 1941 Ohio State team. That's how good they were. Yes, Coach Brown became the youngest head coach in Big Ten history when he took over as a head coach of Ohio State University in 1941. Brown led the Buckeyes to their first ever national championship in just his second season with the school, as writer Jonathan Knight, author of Paul Brown's Ghost, tells us. That he, he basically was a legend at every, all of the major three levels of football in Ohio. He went from Maslin and built the first real power in high school football, national power. Like people across the country in the 1930s, they were so good that people knew of this team across across the United States and knew of Paul Brown and then kind of parlayed that into uh, into the job at Ohio State. And, and Ohio State led them to a national championship. Like, how often do you see that happen? Not very often <laughs> can you jump from high school to college, even back then. And uh, one of the great what ifs, at least in Ohio, uh, football history is is what would have happened had Paul Brown remained at Ohio State. That was interrupted by World War II. World War II interrupted his coaching career and that of many of his players too at Ohio State. Yeah, he joined the Navy. He was in the Navy for a while there. And when he came back, things were a little different. Or when he was about to, as the war was winding down, he kind of expected, I'll, I'll go back to Ohio State and pick up where I left off. Well, things had changed. There were some political things behind the scenes. It didn't quite happen. He opted then to go into professional football and, and, and go into that path. But it's interesting to consider, well, what would have happened? What if he'd have gone to Ohio State? Would we have ever heard of 
Woody Hayes. Would uh, Ohio State football be just as successful, more successful? Would it have been different? In 1943, at the Great Lakes Naval Academy in Chicago, in his two years at Great Lakes, his teams went 15-5-2 with a memorable victory over Notre Dame in 1945. Now, while in Chicago, Brown was stationed with future successful head coaches Weeb Eubank, who served on his coaching staff, and Eric Parsegian and Bud Grant, both players on that Great Lakes team he coached. Now, at the end of his tenure with Great Lakes, Arch Ward, a great media man in Chicago who was starting some sports organizations of his own, approached Paul Brown with the opportunity of coaching in the new All-American Football Conference. The Cleveland franchise originally wanted Notre Dame head coach Frank Leahy, but they were denied, and they may not have been sorry when coach Paul Brown accepted the role. By the time Brown arrived in Cleveland, the team had signed a number of players to its roster. Brown had a great memory and brought in players that he had seen before at the lower ranks of football that he coached. Men from Ohio State, Great Lakes, and Maslin High School teams that Brown had coached, including quarterback Otto Graham, whose Northwestern squad had beaten the Buckeyes coached by Brown in 1941. Lou Groza, a place kicker and tackle, that played for Brown at Ohio State before the war had intervened. Receiver Dante Lavelli was a sophomore in Ohio State's championship winning team in 1942. Bill Willis, he was a defensive lineman whom Brown coached at Ohio State. And Marion Motley, a running back who grew up in Canton and played for Brown at the Great Lakes Naval Academy. Willis and Motley became two of the first black athletes to play professional football when they joined the team in 1946. The Browns won the AAFC championship in all four seasons, 1946 to 1949, and they had their best year in the season of 1948. Greg Trancher, author of the Buffalo Sports Curse and numerous other football books, and also a member of the PFRA, uh, tells us more about this. Um, the Browns finished 15-0 and that year. So they were the first professional football team to complete a season undefeated and untied. Another great historian from the PFRA, Ken Crippen, who is also the founder of the Football Learning Academy, has something to add to Greg's statement. Piggybacking off of what Greg had just said about the undefeated season, to put things in context too, they went 29 straight games without a defeat. And when you think about the four years that they were in the league, they won more championships than they lost games. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that, that puts some perspective on it, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, so that 29-game streak was they won most of 1947, winning the championship, won all of 1948, winning a championship, and then go into 49 and again won the championship. So After four years, the Cleveland Browns winning all four of those championship games of the AAFC, the AFC sort of dissolved and was merged in 1950 into the National Football League. And that was Cleveland's first year. And that's one of the great stories too. The very first game that the Browns played in the NFL, they played the Philadelphia Eagles in 1950. The Eagles had won the previous two. NFL titles and were, you know, the, the the greatest team in pro football at that time. And that was exactly their attitude. They're like, oh, well, who are these guys? We're playing this minor league team on opening night. Do we even need to put shoulder pads on? Like, well, we'll win this. The Browns went out onto their field in Philadelphia and won 35 to 10. That was a great start, but they went on to have more success in 1950 in the NFL. They made it to the NFL title game in their first uh, six seasons in the, in the NFL, wow. which is amazing. They made it five straight championships from 1946 to 1955 through the AAFC and NFL. They won seven out of the 10 years of the championships and were runners up for three other seasons. In 1962, due to conflict with Cleveland Browns new owner, Art Modell, Paul Brown was fired as a head coach. In his 17th season tenure with the Browns, the franchise under Coach Brown accumulated a record of 158, 48, and 8 ties with 7 league championships and 11 division titles. But new opportunities were right around the corner. The American Football League had started in the early 1960s and they were looking for a presence and a franchise in the state of Ohio. 
The Cincinnati Bengals franchise opened up shop in the American Football League in 1967, and they played their first game in 1968, and their owner and head coach was Paul Brown. But the Bengals were, for a long time, you know, the, the cream of the crop in, in, in several years there, in the 70s and, and well into the 80s. And that's just really incredible. It speaks so much to what a, what a genius in some ways that Paul Brown was, how he was able to kind of see into the future, bring the future into the present. In 1975, Brown stepped down as the Cincinnati Bengals head coach on the field, but he remained a very active owner of the franchise. Brown had many innovations. We told you about the shuttling of plays through guards. He also experimented a little bit with radio transmission in a quarterback's helmet. We have a great story on Pigskin Dispatch about that, as well as many other great innovations that he brought to the professional game, his organization, and many other things. Paul Brown is uh, the pick your pick your metaphor, the George Washington pro football, the Henry Ford of pro football, whatever you want to call it. He, he's exactly that. I mean, when you uh, speaking of demarcation lines, you talk about a, a moment that the NFL became what we know today was pretty much the, the moment that Paul Brown got involved with it. He turned the game into the clinical precision machine that that we see today in terms of preparation in terms of practice in terms of intelligence and thought he's one of the i think one of the few coaches that won a high school championship a national championship and then also obviously as we all know he went on to uh coach the cleveland browns and cincinnati Bengals, and obviously won you know uh you know three nfl championships with the browns in the four years that they played in the AFC, they lost a total of four games. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's clearly that's like you're on another level. Like this, this is this is inappropriate. So, but then they move on to the NFL, win the NFL title their very first year. So clearly, he had it figured out. He knew what he was doing at that point, and he was just uh, on another level that we I don't think we've ever seen as as many great coaches as there are today as there have been through the years. I don't think there's ever been a coach that was so much better than the talent around him or than the competition around him than Paul Brown in that era. Indeed, so much better than the rest of his peers. He goes down in memory as one of the greatest coaches ever in football history. He won at the college, the high school, and a professional level. Not too many can say that. Matter of fact, I can only think of one, and that's the great Paul Brown. And we thank you for joining us for this historical tribute to one of the great coaches in football history. We also want to thank the archives and the great experts that joined us, Jonathan Knight, Greg Tranter, Ken Crippen, and George Bazika for their fine work and research on this great man of football. We hope you join us for more great sports history and football history here on pigskindispatch.com. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. A special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Each week, the official Football Learning Academy podcast will take you deep into the history of pro football through interviews with players, coaches, or administrators in the NFL, as well as interviews with Pro Football Hall of Fame selectors, authors, and historians You'll learn how the game evolved and important moments that shaped the sport into what it is today. And don't miss the Pro Football History Nugget of the Week. Listen to the official Football Learning Academy podcast on the Sports History Network. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? 
Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.